Hello everybody. I would like to talk to you today, hopefully preach a little bit, about a message called Throne Time. Throne Time. And uh, it's coming from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, you see what it's there for, and you look back at what, is, what was just said. So because of this high priest, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Throne time. That word boldly has the meaning of confidence built into the word coming before the throne of God imagine that with confidence with confidence now I got this idea of throne time from a brother many years ago that I was talking to and we were I was trying to get him to go somewhere and and he said no I, I can't I can't I've got throne time that was his answer and it stuck with me throughout many years actually decades now throne time and many people are caught somewhere in between two realities the reality that they are sinful like Peter and they want to say to Jesus depart from me for I am a sinful man and the other reality where Jesus said to Peter, he said after Jesus preached a hard message, he said, will you go also? Will you go also? People are caught in between those two realities. Jesus didn't expect them to go. Jesus expected to preach a hard message and for them to stay. It was the crowds that left. And so Jesus said to them, are you going to leave also, even you, that have walked with me? And guess what Peter's words were? Peter said, for where will we go? You are the one that has the words of eternal life. Where are we going to go to, Lord? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. You're the one that has everything my soul needs. And that's my question for you today. Even in your sin, where are you going to go? You have nowhere to go but to Jesus. And even when the message gets so hard, and believe me, many times I'll read that Bible, and I'll read things in that Bible, and, the, and I will see hard things, hard realities, difficult truths, and I can hear Jesus saying, where are you going to go? Will you leave also? Many haven't followed me because of these words. Will you leave also? Well, Lord, where will I go? You have the words of eternal life. And today the answer is coming to Jesus coming to eternal life throne time I remember uh, back in 1982 I was in the military and I was in South Korea and I was in a little chapel praying and I was 
down in between the pews, I was the only one in there. And it was very quiet. I was just enjoying the peacefulness of it all. And I was having some throne time. And all of a sudden, through the back, through the front door, I come barreling this soldier, almost knocked the doors off of their hands. They come flying through. And he come running in. And I heard him say, God, God, I just want to punch him. God, help me. I want to hurt him. And he ran to the altar. I could hear him as he hit, the, hit his knees. And he started just praying and, and hitting the altar and crying out to God as he poured his heart out to God. God, help me. Help me, God, help me. I have bad feelings towards this person. Don't act like you haven't been there now. And he poured his heart out to God. And what the funny thing about it was he didn't know I was in there. And I, but I was, and I heard this whole thing. And he poured his heart out to God. His violent feelings, his wrath, the troubles this person was causing him, what he wanted to do. And it wasn't been a few minutes, just a few minutes. He began to calm down. And then he started thanking Jesus. And he began to, in, in more of a peaceful manner, began to pray over the matter. As he turned over this entire situation into the hands of God. That's what throne time can do for you. That's what I mean by throne time, where you enter into the very presence of God and you get answers to prayer and you pour your heart out to God. That's what I'm talking about. But the truth of the matter is many people don't even do that. They don't even have that throne time with the Lord. They don't have it. I never saw his face, but was left with a vivid and powerful reality of a transformation that can take place when we cast our cares upon the Lord, for he cares for us. I'm here to remind you of that today. <sighs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Before Jesus came, uh, we were forbidden to approach God. We were forbidden, forbidden to approach God. In Exodus, we read about the mountain of God, the mountain of Horeb, where God dwelt. Remember Moses climbed that mountain and he got the Ten Commandments? He was the only one. Everybody else, there was a boundary set around it. And a warning of be careful, don't even touch the base of the mountain unless a dart pierce you through. Forbidden to even approach God. Also in the Old Testament, we find that only the high priest once a year can enter into the Holy of Holies where he can come into the presence of God and make intercession for all of our sin for a year, the sins of the Israelites for a year. And those sins were pushed back one more year. Forbidden to enter the Holy of Holies. Forbidden to live, even to live because of sin. In Ephesians 2, it says, all of us lived among them at one time, fulfilling the cravings of our flesh and indulging its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature the children of wrath. But because of his great love, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> because of his great love, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our trespasses. And when you continue to read in Ephesians, we find that it is said that for through Jesus, we both, listen to these words, 
have access by one spirit unto the Father. Gee, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we would uh, never be able to approach God. We would be just like Adam and Eve who was ran from the garden, ran from the presence of God, forbidden to eat of the tree of eternal life. Never, ever, ever to have that fellowship with the Lord again. Never again. Never again. But thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <coughs> Eastern religions does not offer what the gospel of Jesus Christ can offer. There's no fellowship in those religions. Money and material things, status and reputation and family bloodlines cannot offer what Jesus can offer. That cannot bridge the gap between man and God. But yet the world is running rampant, running rampant, running after material things and the things of the world, trying to bridge a gap inside their soul that can only be bridged by Jesus Christ. Belonging to the Catholic Church will not save your soul. Or any denominational church of the Protestant side, that won't save you. Religion will not save you. Good works, giving money, building churches, going out on missionary works like the Mormons do. None of that adds anything to your salvation. You are still forbidden to even have fellowship with God until you take care of the sin matter and that is only taken care of through Jesus Christ. After the sin matter is taken care of, then it opens up and you can have throne time with God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Until then, you can't have no throne time with God. You're forbidden to. Amen. There's only one key that can unlock the doors that have locked us out, and that is Jesus Christ. He said to Peter, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But right before that, when Peter's, when he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, blessed art thou, Peter, for it was not revealed to you except through the Father. And upon this rock, or upon that revelation, that he is the Son of God, upon that as the rock, that revelation being the foundation, upon that he will build his church. So who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? What about you? Just another good guy? There's so many, so many poor, poor excuses and poor uh, efforts and poor theology and poor uh, uh, ideas of who Jesus is. You're not going to find out who Jesus is until you admit that you are sinful, until you admit you are separated from God and you humble yourself and you cry out to Jesus as your mediator, as your sacrifice, as your savior, and you give it all to him. And you ask him to come into your life as you turn from your sin and you turn from the world to follow Jesus. And then you will be born again through that process and you will have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he will never leave you and he will never forsake you. <coughs> you got to know who Jesus is. You got to know who he is. He is the key to this whole thing. Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. Listen to these holy words. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Let me just stop right there. 
In the Old Testament, there was a veil between the Holy of Holies and the common people and the other priests and everybody else and all the other tribes and everything else that was going on in the entire world. A thick curtain. And only the high priest can go through that curtain. And he had bells on his robe. And it was so holy in there that if he did one thing wrong, and all of the law and everything that was spelled out in the Old Testament for him to do, if he did one thing wrong, they would they would no longer hear the bells, uh, excuse me, make a noise. They had a rope tied around his ankle and they would pull him out because they dared not to go in. Well, right here it says, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, his flesh. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the Bible says that the veil was rent from top to bottom, ripped. And when you read the wording in that, and you do a little word study, it was done as if in a hurry. And it was God Almighty that did it. He rent the, the veil in the Holy of Holies when Christ's flesh was crucified for us. And in that you could see some typology through Christ and the veil that now it's a whosoever gospel. Whosoever will can come and partake of the tree of life and the fountain of life, which is Jesus Christ. Oh my God, the gospel's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Let us draw near. We're talking in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. If you don't have faith, you are not coming into the presence of God. You cannot partake of this holy event that was wrought by Jesus Christ through his blood. You must have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God. You have to have faith. And if you're a child of God, you have the covenant privilege of coming before the throne of God to pour out your heart to God. But if you are a sinner that, have, that has never been born again, you've never repented of your sins, and by repenting of your sins, I mean you have turned from them. You had a change of heart that caused your feet to change directions. And now you're following after Jesus Christ. If that's you, you have to take care of that first. You have no rights. You have no privileges before the throne of God. The only privilege you have is to repent of your sin and to allow Christ to be your Savior through faith. And with that, I would highly advise that you are baptized in Jesus' name. Not that there's some magic formula or anything like that, but that the Bible teaches how that the death of burial and resurrection of not Buddha, not anybody in the Hindu religion, not Plato, but Jesus. When we're baptized, it's symbolic of Christ's death, not those other people. Christ's burial, not those other people. Christ's resurrection, no, nobody else has ever resurrected. So we're baptized in Jesus' name. All right, let's keep moving on here. I still got some things to cover. Just as whether you're a child of God or a sinner, either way, and sometimes this does apply to children of God. Just as that man who come through those, he was he was a born he was a Christian. Just as that man that, that barreled through those doors of that chapel and threw himself down on the ground. And cried out to God, God, help me. I just want to punch him. Okay, and poured his heart out to God. <clears throat> and gave God the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay? 
that God is not offended <clears throat> when we when we open up and we tell him just how it is. You have to open up and tell him just how it is. He's not offended in any way, shape, or form. If you think some high, lofty, featherly, floating prayer with King James Version flowery poetry in it makes you look good in the eyes of God, you stink. You stink. Your sins is a stench in the nostrils of God, and these flowery prayers that have no heart in it doesn't make things any better. O oh, thou most gracious heavenly Father, we come to thee in our hour of prayer. That doesn't impress anybody. Nobody. You're only fooling yourself when what you need to do is fall on your face and pour your filthy heart out to God and ask God to do a work in your heart and in your spirit. He's a high priest, or he's not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He feels it. He was at all points tempted like as we are. We forget that. We forget that. No matter what horrible temptation you're going through, Jesus Christ can feel your pain. Jesus Christ was tempted in that same way. Yet without sin. Thank God. Yet without sin. The devil will tell you, go ahead and sin. God loves you, remember? He's got great grace and he died on the cross and all you got to do is ask him to forgive you and he will. And then the minute you sin, the minute you listen to the devil, he switches on you. And then he'll say, well, look what you did. There is no way that a holy God could ever forgive a sinful act like that, especially from somebody like you who knew better. The devil will stab you right in the back. And it all goes on right in your spirit and in your mind. Y'all with me out there? That's just like the devil. But the Bible says in 1 John, or, or, or John 8, 44, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. And he's lying to you because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's the devil for you, right there. To keep you away, just like Peter, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. When you have a compassionate Savior, that all he asks is that we confess and forsake our sin. 1 John 2, 1 says, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You're not righteous. I'm not righteous. Nobody's righteous without Jesus Christ. He was without sin. He never failed. He is purely righteous and he is our advocate but you cannot have the benefits of this advocate if you don't come before the throne and take care of these sinful matters that are in your life we all need to do that I heard a preacher say many years ago, keep short accounts with sin. 
There's something about sin. If you sin, <coughs> excuse me, and you don't take it to the Lord, you add to it. A week goes by, you're doing more of it. A month goes by, you're doing more horrible sin. But the minute you sin, when you sin, realize I need to fall out into the light. I need to approach the throne of God through Jesus Christ and take care of this. That's what we need to do. In the book of Hebrews, it's the theme is throne time. In Hebrews 4, 16, let us draw near. Let's look at this, how it progresses. Let us draw near with confidence. Let's see how much time I got left. I don't know. Oh boy. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne. Hebrews 4, 16. Hebrews 10, 19 and 22. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. In Hebrews 11, it addresses the Old Testament saints in what's called the uh, Faith's Hall of Fame. And the Bible says these all died in faith. Then that brings us to Hebrews chapter 12, where the writer then assumes the reader is applying what he has written and has entered the throne room before the Lord. And now listen to how chapter 12 opens up. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. The idea of that scripture is that you're right there with the Old Testament saints, uh, compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses, the angels, all the hosts of heaven, in, in and at the throne of God that you're right there being encouraged by those words right there. When you look at Hebrews being the theme of throne time, it's definitely got scripture to back that up. And all of this takes place before we die. Every scripture application is before we die, right now, right now, throne time. If, I'm just going to keep going. If this thing ends, that, well, I guess that's where, where I'll end it. If you want to hold on to your sin like Adam and hide from God, then you can never experience the freedom that comes with God. Sin's hold is only broken when we find something more attractive and more alluring and more satisfying, more important to us. And once we find that, the hold that sin has, the grip that sin has. And I'm even talking about Christians. Christians that may have a, a sin that's holding them in bondage. When you look into the face of Jesus Christ, you can see the glory of God. There's actually scripture for that, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. But you can't do it if you don't spend time with him. The more you look at Jesus, the more you spend time in his presence, the more you consider him, the more you pour your heart out to him, the more lovely and precious he becomes. And that sin it just falls right off. Going to a church with rules and regulations and holiness codes backed up by the pet peeves of men can never take the place 
of a heart that is full of the holiness of Jesus Christ. The love relationship there. When you have that, you have holiness and you will live right. You will live right. I believe I should probably wrap this up. Boy, I got some more here. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Ephesians 6, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters in the to the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered on our behalf. It's talking about the Holy of Holies in heaven. There is a Holy of Holies in heaven. James 4.8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Philippians 4.6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Are you doing it? Do you have throne time? If not, maybe that's why you're depressed and maybe that's why you're anxious. Maybe that's why you're angry. Maybe that's why you're burdened down with the things of the world and you're walking around, kicking your jaw every time you take a step. You need to spend time before the throne of God. Last scripture, Psalms 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Praise God. Throne time get you some it will help it will meet that need it will satisfy your soul spend time with God there's a lot going on in the world today a lot a lot but you can you've got something special with the Lord right there before his throne spend time with him it'll bring a peace upon your soul <clears throat> You may say, well, I don't have time. There's, everything is so hectic. Well, let me tell you one last thing. John Wesley's mother, Susan Wesley, had 17 kids. 17 kids. But they knew that when she pulled her apron up over her head, not to disturb her. You see, that's the only way that she could find a little bit of time to spend with her God. Imagine that. So busy taking care of 17 kids back in the 17th century where women did a lot of work. Pull that apron over the head and finding God. You can enter into the throne of God from any situation that you are at. Any situation. <clears throat> 